continuing Speak of the Devil with Wandering Willie's Tale by Sir Walter Scott. You mound have heard of Sir Robert Redgauntlet of that ilk who lived in these parts before the dear years. The country will lang mind him, and our fathers used to draw breath thick if ever they heard him named. He was out with the highwaymen in Montrose's time, and again he was in the hills with Glencairn in the sixteen hundred and fifty two and sack when King Charles the second came in. What was in sick favor as Laird of Red Gauntlet, he was knighted at Lanon Court with the king's ain sword, and being a red hot palatist, he came down here from Palging like a lion, with commissions of lieutenancy and of lunacy, for what I can to put down uh, the Whigs and Covenanters in the country. Wild work they made of it, for the Whigs were as dure as the Cavaliers were fierce, and it was which should first tire the other. Red Gauntlet was A for the strong hand, and his name is tend as wide in the country as clever houses are Tom Dalgills, Glen, nor Dargle, nor mountain, nor cave could hide the pure hill folk when Red Gauntlet was out with the bolt. The, the bugle and bloodhound after them, as if they had been sack, mony deer, and troth when they found him, they didn't uh, make muckle, mere ceremony, then a highland men with a roebuck, it was just. Will ye talk the test? If not, make ready, present, fire, and there lay recusant. Far and wide was Sir Robert hated and feared. Men thought he had a direct compact with Satan that he was proof against steel and that bullets tapped at his buff coat like hailstones from a hearth. And he had a mirror that would turn a hair on the side of Terefra guns and muckle to the same purpose of Wilk Mer Anon. The best blessing they weared on was Thou scalp me the gauntlet. He wasna a bad maester to his ain folk, though, and was weel and yelf liked by his tenants. And as for lackeys and troopers that raid out with him to the persecutions, as the Whigs called those killing times, they wad ha. Drunken themselves blind to his health at any time. Now you are ken that my good sire lived on Red Gauntlet's grood. They come the place, Pembrose Miller. We had lived on the grund and under the Red Gauntlets since the writing days and lying before. It was a pleasant bit. And I think the air is colorer and fresher there than anywhere else in the country. It's uh, deserted now. And I sat on the broken door cheek three days since and was glad I could not see the plight and place was in. But that's a wide o oh, the mark. There dwelt my guide, sire, Steeny Steenson. 
a rambling, rattling, teal. He had been in his young days and can play wheel on the pipes. He was famous at Uppers and Girders, a Cumberland, could not touch him, at Jockey Latin, and he had the finest finger for the back lilt between Betterwick and Carlisle's, the like of Steeny, wasna the sort that made the Whigs O, oh, and he became a Tory, as they cut it, which we now call Jacobites, just out of a kind of necessity that he might belong to some side or other. He had not a will to the Whig bodies, and like little to see the blued wren, though being obliged to follow Sir Robert in hunting and hoisting, watching and warding, he saw muckle mischief and maybe did some that he could not avoid. Now Steeny was a kind of favorite with his master and Kina the folks about the castle and was often sent for a play the pipes when they were at their merriment. Ald Dougal Macallum, the butler that had followed Sir Robert through good and ill, thick and thin, pool and stream, was specially fond of the pipes. And a ga, my good desire, is good word with a laird, for Dougal could turn his master round his finger. Wheel round came the revolution, and it had to have broken the hearts, both of Dougal and his master. But change was not a uh, the gither sa great as they feared and other folk thought for. The Whigs made an unco crying what they would do with their owd enemies, and in special with Sir Robert Ritty Gauntlet, but they were o'er many great folks dipped in the same doings to mack a spick and span new world. So Parliament passed it uh, o'er easy, and Sir Robert that he was held to hunting foxes instead of covetors, remained just the man he was. His revel was as loud and as hall as we elected as ever it had been, though maybe he lacked the fines of the nonconformist that used to come to stock his larder and cellar, for it is certain he began to be keener about the rents than his tenants used to find him before, and they behooved to be prompt to the rent day, or else the laird was not pleased, and he was sick and awesome body that na, but he cared to anger him for the oaths he swore and the rags that he used to get into, and the looks that he put on made men sometimes think him a devil incarnate. Wheel, my good sire, was na manager, so that he was a very great misguider, but he had na the saving gift, and he got twa terms rent in a rear. He got the first rash at Whit Sunday, put hour with fair word and piping, but when Martin Mas came, there was a summons from the Grund officer to come with the rent on a day precis, or else Steeny behooved to flit. Sir Wark, he had to get the siller, but he was will fringed, and at last he got the hailscrip that gither a thousand merks. The maist of it was from a neighbor they called Lori Lebreik, a sly Todd. Lori had wealth, Algier, could hunt with the hound and run with the hare, and be wigged our Tory, saunt our sinner, 
and as the wind stood, he was a professor in this revolution world, but he liked an aura saw of the world and a tune on the pipes, wheel and nuth at the by time and abun a he thought he had goods security for the seller and lent my good sire owner the stocking at primrose no away trots my good sire to red gauntlet castle with a heavy purse and a light heart glad to be out of the laird's danger weel the first thing he learned at the castle was that sir robert had fretted himself into a fit of the gout because he did not appear before twelve o'clock. It wasn't a ah, that gither for the sake of the money, Dougal thought, but because he didn't like to part with my good sire at the ground. Dougal was glad to see Steenie and brought him into the great oak parlor and there sat the laird his Elysium Lane, excepting that he had beside him a great ill-favored jackanape that was a special pet of his. A cankered beast it was, and money an ill-natured trick it played. Ill to please it was, and easily angered, ran about the hail castle, chattering and yelling, and pinching and biting folk, especially before ill weather or disturbances in the state. Sir Robert called it Major Wire after the warlock that was burnt, and few folk liked either the name or the conditions of the creature. They thought there was something in it by ordinary, and my good sire was not just easy in mind when the door shut on him, and he saw himself in the room with nobody but the laird, Dougal MacCoolum and the major, a thing that had not chance him before. Sir Robert sat, or I should say, lay in a great armchair with his grand velvet gown and his feet on a cradle, for he had made gout and gravel, and his face looked as gash and ghastly as Satan's. Major Wire sat opposite to him in a red lance coat and the laird's wig on his head. And A, as Sir Robert yearned with pain, the jackanape yearned to, like a sheep's head, between a pair of tangs. An ill fared, fearsome couple they were. The laird's buff coat was hung on a pin behind him, and his broadsword and his pistols within reach, for he kept it up, the old fashion of having the weapons ready and a horse saddled day and night, just as he used to do when he was able to loop on horseback, and away after Ani of the hill folk, he could get spearings up. Some said it was for the fear of the Whigs taking vengeance, but I judge it was just his old custom. He wasn't a gain to fear anything. The Rentau book with its black cover and brass clasp was lying beside him, and a book of Skuldadri sangs was put betwixt the leaves to keep it open at the place where it bore evidence against the good man of Primrose No. As behind the hand with his mails and duties, Sir Robert gave my good sire a look as if he would have withered his heart in his bosom. E. Mound Ken, he had a way of bending his brows that men saw the visible mark of a horseshoe in his forehead, deep dinted as if it had been stamped there. Are ye come, light-handed, ye son of a tune whistle, said Sir Robert. Zounds, if you are, my good sire, with as good a countenance as he could put on, made a leg and placed the bag of money on the table with a dash, like a man that does something clever. The laird drew it to him hastily. Is it all here, steamy man? Your honor will find it right, said my good sire. Here, Dougal, said the laird. Give Steenie a tass of brandy downstairs. Till I count, 
the siller and write the receipt. But they were now wheel out of the room when Sir Robert feed a yellock that guard the castle rock. Back ran Dougal, in flew the liverymen. Yell on yell, gied the laird, ilk and mare, al fu then ither. My good sire knew not whether to stand or flee, but he ventured back into the parlor, where a was goon hirdy girdy. Now, buddy, to say, come in, or got out. Terribly, the laird roared, for he can water to his feet and wine to cool his throat, and hell, hell, hell in its flames. Was a the word in his mouth? They brought him water, and when, then, plunged his swollen feet into the tub, he cried out it was burning, and folk say that it did bubble and sparkle like a seething cauldron. He flung the cup at Dougal's head and said he had given him blood instead of burgundy. And sure enough, the last wash clotted blood off the carpet, nice day. The jackanape they called Major Wire, it gibbered and cried as if it was mocking its master. My good sire's head was like to turn, he forgot they siller and receipt, and downstairs he banged. But as he ran, the shrieks came faint and fainter. There was a deep drawn, shivering groan, and word gad through the castle that the laird was dead. Wheel away came my good sire, with his finger in his mouth, and his best hope was that Dougal had seen the money bag and heard the laird speak of writing the receipt. The young laird, now Sir John, came from Edinburgh to see things put to rights. Sir John and his father never greed wheel. Sir John had been bred an advocate and afterwards sat in the last Scots Parliament and voted for the Union having gotten. It was thought a rug of the compensators, if his father could have come out of his grave, he would have brained him for it on his own hearthstan. Some thought it was easier counting with the old rough knight than the fair spoken young and but mayor of that anon. Dougal Mac Cullum, poor body. Neither grat nor grand, but gad about the house looking like a corpse, but directing, as was his duty, uh, the order of the grand funeral. Now Dougal looked a what er and what er when night was coming, and was a the last to gang to his bed. Wilk was in a little round just opposite the chamber of Da'is, Wilk, his master, occupied while he was living, and where he now lay in state, as they called it, wheel a day, the night before the funeral. Dougal could keep his own counsel no longer. He came down with his proud spirit and fairly axed Ald on to sit in his room with him for an hour when they were in the round Dougal took a pass of brandy to himself and gave another to an and wished him ill health and lang life and said that for himself he wasn't a lang for this world for that every night since Sir Robert's death his silver call had sounded from the state chamber just as it used to do at nights in his lifetime to call Dougal to help to turn him in his bed, Dougal said that being alone with the dead on that floor of the tower, for nobody cared to wake Sir Robert for gauntlet like another corpse. He had never dared to answer the call, but that now his conscience checked him for neglecting his duty, for though death breaks service, said MacCullum, it shall never break my service to Sir Robert and I will answer his next whistle. So be you will stand by me, Hutchin. Hutchin had now will to the work. 
that he had stood by Dougal in the battle and broil. And he let not fail him at this pinch. So down the carros sat over a stoop of brandy. And Hutchin, who was something of a clerk, would have read a chapter of the Bible. But Dougal would hear nothing but a wad a baby Lindsay. Wilk was the water preparation. When midnight came and the house was quiet as the grave, sure enough, the silver whistle sounded as sharp and shrill as if Sir Robert was blowing it. And up got the twa owled serving men and tottered into the room where the dead man lay. Utchin saw enough at the first glance, for there were torches in the room which showed him the foul fiend in his ain shape, sitting on the laird's coffin. Our he cooped as if he had been dead. He could not tell how long he lay in a trance at the door, but when he gathered himself, he cried on his neighbor. And getting that answered, raised the house when Dougal was found lying dead within twas steps of the bed where his master's coffin was placed. As for the whistle, it was gan, ends and a, but many a time it was heard at the top of the house on the partisan and among the owled chimneys and turrets where the howlets have their nests. Sir John hushed the matter up, and the funeral passed over without mare buglewark. But when a was hour, and the laird was beginning to settle his affairs, every tenant was called up for his arrears, and my good sire, for the full sum that stood against him in the rental book, wheel away he trots to the castle to tell his story, and there he is introduced to Sir John, sitting in his father's chair in deep mourning, with weepers and hanging cravat, and a small walking right here by his side, instead of the old broad sword that had a hundred weight of steel about it. What with blade, chap, and basket hilt, I have heard their communing so oft, could hour that I almost think I was there myself, though I couldn't be born at the time. In fact, Alan, my companion, mimicked with a good deal of humor the flattering, conciliatory tone of the tenant's address and the hypocritical melancholy of the laird's reply. His grandfather, he said, had, while he spoke, his eye fixed on the rental book as if it were a mastiff dog that he was afraid would spring up and bite him. I was a joy, sir, of the head seat and the white loaf and the prayer lairdship. Your father was a kind man to friends and followers. Muckle grace to you, Sir John, to fill his shoon, his boots, I should say, for he seldom wore shoon unless it were Liz when he had the gout. A steeny, quoth the laird, sighing deeply and putting his napkin to his aim. He, his was a sudden call, and he will be missed in the country. No time to set his house in order. We have prepared Godward, no doubt, which is the root of the matter, but left us behind a tangled hesp to win. Steeny, hem, hem. We mount go to business, steeny. Much to do and little time to do it in. Here he opened the fatal volume. I have heard of a thing they call Doomsday Book. I am clear it has been a rental of back gang tenants. Step in, said Sir John, still in the same soft, sleeket tone of voice. Step in, Stevenson, our Steenson. Ye are down here for a year's rent behind the hand, due at last term. Step in, said, please your honor, Sir John. I paid it to your father, Sir John said. Ye took a receipt then, doubtless, Stephen, and can produce it. Stephen said, indeed, I hadn't a time, and it, like your honor, were na sooner had I set down the siller 
and just as its honor, Sir Robert that's game drew it tell him to count it and write out the receipt he was tied with the pains that removed him that was unlucky said sir john after a pause but maybe paid it in the presence of somebody i want but a callous qualis evidence Stephen, i would go our strictly to work with no poor man. Stephen said, truth, Sir John. There was nobody in the room but Dougal McCollum, the butler, but as your honor kens, he as Ain followed his old master. Very unlucky again, Stephen, said Sir John, without altering his voice a single note. The man to whom he paid the money is dead, and the man who witnessed the payment is dead too. And the siller, which should have been to the fore, is neither seen nor heard. Tell of in the repositories. How am I to believe of this? Stephen said, I then can, your honor, but there is a bit memorandum note of the very coins. For God help me, I had to borrow out of 20 purses, and I am sure that Elka man they're set down, will take his grit oath for what purpose I borrowed the money. Sir John said, I have little doubt ye borrowed the money, Steenie. It is the payment to my father that I want to have some proof of. Stephen said, the siller mound be about the house, Sir John. And since your honor never got it, and his honor that was canna have a tatten it with him, Maybe some of the family may have seen it. Sir John said, We will examine the servants, Stephen. That is but reasonable. But lackey and lass, and page and groom, all denied stoutly that they had ever seen such a bag of money as my good sire described. What was whopper he had, unluckily, not mentioned to any living soul of them, his purpose of paying his rent. Ah, Koyan had noticed something under his arm, but she took it out. She took it for the pipes. Sir John Wardgauntlet ordered the servants out of the room and then said to my good sire, Now, Steenie, ye see you have fair play, and as I have little doubt, ye can better were to find the siller than anybody. I beg in fair terms, and for your own sake, that you will end this fashiri for Stephen, ye ma'an pay or flit. The Lord forgee your opinion, says Stephen, driven almost to his wit's end. I am an honest man. So am I, Stephen, said his honor. And so are all the folks in the house, I hope. But if there be a knave among us, it must be he that tells the story he cannot prove. He paused and then added, my ear sternly, if I understand your trick, sir, you want to take advantage of some malicious reports concerning things in this family, and particularly respecting my father's sudden death, thereby to cheat me out of the money, and perhaps take away my character by insinuating that I have received the rent I am demanding. Where do you suppose this money to be? I insist upon knowing. My good sire saw everything look sa muckle against him that he grew nearly desperate. However, he shifted from one foot to another, looked every corner of the room, and made no answer. Speak out, Sarah, said the laird, assuming a look of his father's, a very particular and which he had when he was angry. It seemed as if the wrinkles of his frown made that self-same fearful shape of a horse's shoe in the middle of his brow. Speak out, sir. I will know your thoughts. Do you suppose that I have this money? Far be it from me to say so, said Stephen. Do you charge any of my people with having taken it? I would be late to charge them. That may be innocent, said my good sire, 
And if there be any one that is guilty, I have not proved. Somewhere the money must be, if there is a word of truth in your story, said Sir John. I asked where you think it is, and the man a correct answer, and hell, if you have my thoughts on it, said my good sire, driven to extremity, in hell, with your father, his jackanape, and his silver whistle. Down the stairs he ran, for the parlor was now a place for him. After such a word, and he heard the laird swearing blood and words behind him, as fast as ever did Sir Robert, and roaring for the Bailey and the Baron officer, away rode my good sire, to his chief creditor, him, the cod glory, Leprake, to try if he could make anything out of him. But when he told his story, he got but the worst word in his wing. Thief, beggar, and diver were the saptest terms, and to the boot of these hard terms. Lori brought up the old story of his dipping his hand in the blood of God's sounds, just as if a tenant could have helped riding with the laird, and that a laird like Sir Robert Redgauntlet, my good sire, was by this time far beyond the bounds of patience, and while he and Lori were at dial speed the lairds, he was one chancy enough to abuse a Praik's doctrine as weel as the man and said the things that guard folks flesh grew that heard them. He wasn't a just himself, and he had lived with a uh, wild set in his day. At last they parted, and my good sire was to ride ham, though the wood of Pitmarkey, that is a fowl of black burrs, as they say, I can the wood, but the burrs may be black or white, for what I can tell. At the entry of the wood, there is a wild common, and on the edge of the common, a little lonely change house that was kept it then by an ostler wife. They saw had it her tibby fall, and their poor Steeny cried for a muchkin of brandy, for he had no refreshment. The Hail day to be was earnest with him to take a bite o meat, but he couldn't a think a t nor would he take his foot out of the stirrup and took off the brandy wholly at twa draughts and named a toast at each. The first was the memory of Sir Robert Redgauntlet, and might he never lie quiet in his grave till he had righted his poor bound tenant. And the second was a health to man's enemy. If he would but get him back the pock of siller, or tell him what came ought for, he saw the hail world was like to regard him as a thief and a cheat, and he took that water then, even the ruin of his house, and held. On he rode, little caring where. It was a dark night turned, and the trees made it yet darker. And he let the beast take its ain road through the wood, when all of a sudden, from tired and wearied that it was before, the nag began to spring and flee and sten, that my good sire could hardly keep the saddle. Upon the wilk, a horseman suddenly riding up beside him said that's a metal beast of yours dreamed will you sell him so saying he touched the horse's neck with his riding wand and it fell into its old high ho of a stumbling trot but his spunk soon out of him i think continued the stranger and that is like money a man's courage that thinks he would do great things till he come to the proof.
My good sire, scarce listen to this, but spurred his horse with good a end to you, fiend. Fiend. But it's like the stranger was on that does not lightly yield his point. For ride as Steeny liked, he was a beside him, the self, self pace. At last, my good sire, Steeny Steenson, grew half angry, and to say the truth, half feared. What is it that ye want with me, friend? He said, if ye be a robber, I had that money. If ye be a little man, wanting company, I have not heart to mirth or speaking. And if ye want to ken the road, I scarce ken it myself. If ye will tell me your grief, said the stranger, I am one that though I have been sair miscod in the world, am the only hand for helping my friends. So, my good sire to ease his ain heart, mire than from any hope of help, told him the story from the beginning to the end. It's a hard pinch, said the stranger, but I think I can help you. If you could lend the money, sir, and take a lang day, I can na other help on earth, said my good sire. But there may be some under the earth, said the stranger. Come, I'll be frank with you. I could lend you the money on bond, but you would maybe scruple my terms. Now I can tell you that your old laird is disturbed in his grave by your curses and the wailing of your family. And if you dare venture to go to see him, he will give you the receipt. My good sire's hair stood on end at this proposal, but he thought his companion might be some humorsome child that was trying to frighten him and might end with lending him the money. Besides, he was bowed with brandy and desperate with distress. And he said he had courage to go to the gate of hell and a step farther for that receipt. The stranger laughed. Wheel, they rode on through the thickest of the wood. When all a, a sudden, the horse stopped at the door of a great house and but that he knew the place was ten miles off. My father would have thought he was at Red Gauntlet Castle. They rode into the outer courtyard through the muckle falding yets, and underneath the owl portcullis, and the whole front of the house was lighted, and there were pipes and fiddles, and as much dancing and deray within as used to be at Sir Robert's house. At pace and yule, and such high seasons, they lap off, and my good sire, as seemed to him, fastened his horse to the very ring he had tied him that morning, when he had gad to wait on the good Sir John. God, said my good sire, if Sir Robert's death be but a dream, he knocked on the hat door, just as he was wont, and his old acquaintance, Dougal Macculum, just after his want too, came to open the door and said, Piper Steeny, are ye there, lad? Sir Robert has been crying for you. My good sire was like a man in a dream. He looked for the stranger, but he was gan for the time. At last, he just tried to say, Ha, Dougal, drive o'er, are ye living? I thought ye had been dead. Never bash yourself with me said Dougal, but look to yourself, and see ye talk, nothing fra, on the body here, neither meat, drink, or cellar, except just the receipt that is in your aim. So saying, he led the way through the hills and trances that were wheel ken to my good sire, and into the old oak parlor, and there was as much singing of profane sangs and burling of red wine and speaking blasphemy and scuddery as ever been in Red Gauntlet Castle when it was at the blithest. But Lord take us in keeping what a set of ghastly revelers they were that sat round that table. 
my good sire, tend money that had long before gained to their place, for often he had piped to the most part in the hall a red gauntlet. There was the fierce Middleton and the dissolute Roths, and the crafty Lauderdale and Dalgill with his bald head and a beard to his girdle. An earl shall with Cameron's blood on his hand, and wild Bonshaw that tied blessed Mr. Cargill's limbs, till the blood sprung, and the Merton Douglas, the twice turned traitor, bathed to country and king. There was the Bluedi advocate, McKenney, who, for his worldly wit and wisdom, had been to the rest as a god. And there was Claverhouse, as beautiful as when he lived, with his long, dark, curled locks streaming down over his laced buff coat and his left hand always on his right steel blade to hide the wound that the silver bullet had made. He sat apart from them all and looked at them with a melancholy, haughty countenance, while the rest hallooed and sung and laughed that the room rang. But their smiles were fearfully contorted from time to time, and their laugh passed into such wild sounds as made my good sire's very nails grow blue and chilled the marrow in his veins. They that waited at the table were just the wicked serving men and troopers that had done their work and cruel bidding on earth. There was the lang lad of the nether town that helped to take Argyle and the bishop's seminar that they called the Dallow's Rattlebag and the Wicked Guardsmen in their laced coats and the Savage Highland Amorites that shed blood like water and money a proud serving man, haughty of heart and bloody of hand, cringing to the rich and making them wickeder than they would be, grinding the poor to power, powder when the rich had broken them to fragments and money money mare for coming and ganging ah as busy in the vocation as if they had been alive sir robert redgauntlet in the midst ah uh, this fearful riot cried with a voice like thunder on steamy piper to come to the board head where he was sitting his legs stretched out before him and swathed up with flannel his holster pistols aside him while the great broadsword rested against his chair, just as my good sire had seen him the last time upon earth. The very cushion for the jaconate was close to him, but the creature itself was not there. It wasn't that its hour, it's likely for he heard them say, as he came forward, it's not the major come yet. And another answer, the jaconate will be here before times the morn. And when my good sire came forward, Sir Robert, or his ghost, or the devil in his likeness, said, Wheel Piper, ha ye, settle with my sons for the year's rent. With much ado, my father gat breath to say Sir John would not settle without his honor's receipt. He shall ha that for a tune of the pipes. Steeny, said the appearance of Sir Robert. Play us up, wheel huddled lucky. Now this was a tune, my good sire. Learned Fra a warlock that heard it when they were worshipping Satan at their meetings. Warlock's just a word for traitor. It doesn't have anything to do with this. And I, I, I uh, obviously. Obviously, the author has good enough English and whatnot not to do this stuff. I, I, I don't know. He's trying to make me sound like like Scottish people with that with the speech impediment as far as speaking English is concerned. Is, is that what they're trying to do? And my good sir had sometimes played it at the reigning suppers at Red Gauntlet Castle, but never 
willingly. And now he grew, could at the very name of it, and said, For excuse, he had not his pikes with him. Matt Column, ye limb of Beelzebub, said the fearful Sir Robert, bring Steenie to the pipes that I'm keeping for him. Mac Cullum brought a pair of pipes, might have served the piper of Donald of Isles, but he gave my good sire a nudge as he offered them, and looking secretly and closely, Steenie saw that the chanter was of steel and heated to a white heat, so he had fair warning not to trust his fingers with it. So he excused himself again and said he was faint and frightened and had not wind and now to fill the bag. Then ye ma'un eat and drink steenie, said the figure, for we do little else here. And it's ill speaking between a foo man and a fasting. Now, these were the very words that bloody Earl of Douglas said to keep the king's messenger in hand while he cut the head off MacLellan of Bombay at the Threev Castle, and that put Steeny Mare and Mare on his guard. So he spoke up like a man and said he came neither to eat or drink or make minstrelsy, but simply for his aim to ken what was come of the money that he had paid and to get a discharge for it. And he was so stout-hearted by this time that he charged Sir Robert for conscience's sake. He had no power to say the holy name, and as he hoped for peace and rest, to spread no snares for him, but just to give him his aim. That appearance gnashed his teeth and laughed, but it took from a large pocket book the receipt and handed it to Steeny. There is your receipt, ye pitiful cur, and for the money, my dog whelp of a son may go look for it in the cat's cradle. My good sire uttered the money thanks and was about to retire when Sir Robert roared aloud, Stop though, thou sack doodling son of a whore. I am not done with thee. Here we do nothing for nothing, and you must return on this very day, twelve month, to pay your master the homage that you owe me for my protection. My father's tongue was loosed of a suddenty, and he said aloud, I refer myself to God's pleasure and not to yours. He had no sooner uttered the word that all was dark around him, and he sunk on the earth with such a sudden shock that he lost both breath and sense. How long Steeny lay there, he could not tell, but when he came to himself, he was lying in Ald Kirkyard of uh, Red Gauntlet Parochin just at the door of Family Isle, and the scutcheon of the Ald Knight Sir Robert hanging over his head. There was a deep mourning fog on the grass, and gravesten around him, and his horse was beating quietly beside the minister's cows. Steeny would have thought the whole was a dream, but he had the receipt in his hand, fairly written and signed by the Oud Laird. Only the last letters of his name were a little disorderly, written like one seized with a sudden pain. Sorely troubled in his mind, he left that dreary place, rode through the mists to Red Gauntlet Castle, and with much ado, he got speech of the laird. Well, you diver bankrupt was the first word. Have you brought me my rent? No, answered my good sire. I have not. But I have brought your honor Sir Robert's receipt for it. How, Sarah? Sir Robert's receipt? He told me he had not given you one. Will your honor please see it? That bit line is right. Sir John looked at every line and at every letter with much attention, and at last the date, which my good sire had not observed. From my appointed place, he read, this 25th of November. What? That is yesterday. Villain, thou must 
have gone to hell for this. I got it from your honor's father. Whether he be in heaven or hell, I know not, said Steenie. I will delay you for a warlock, the privy council, said Sir John. I will send you to your master, the devil, with the help of a tar barrel and a torch. I intended to delight myself to the presbyter, said Steenie, and tell them all I have seen last night. Welk are things fitter for them to judge uh, than a borrowed man like me. Sir John paused, composed himself, and desired to hear the full history. And my good sire told it him from point to point, as I have told to you word for word, neither more or less. Sir John was silent again for a long time, and at last, he said, very composedly, Steeny, the story of yours concerns the honor of many a noble family besides mine. And if it be a leasing making to keep yourself out of my danger, the least you can expect is to have a red hot iron driven through your tongue. And that will be as bad as scalding your fingers with a red hot chanter. But yet it may be true, Steenie. And if the money cast up, I shall not know what to think of it. But where shall we find a cat's cradle? There are cats enough about the old house, but I think they kitten without the ceremony of bed or cradle. We were best ax Hutchin, said my gut sire. He tends uh, the odd corners about as weel as another serving man that is now gan, and that I wet not like to name. A weel Hutchin, when he was axed, told them that Arunus turret, long disused, next to the clock house, only accessible by a ladder, for the opening was on the outside, and far above the battlements was called of old the cat's cradle. There will I go immediately, said Sir John, and he took, with what purpose? Evan Ken's, one of his father's pistols, from the hall table, where they had lain since the night he died, and hastened to the battlements. It was a dangerous place to climb, for the ladder was owled and frail, and he wanted an a trois rounds. However, up got Sir John and entered at the turret door, where his body stopped, the only light that was in the bit turret. Something pleased at him with a vengeance. Maced dang him back our bang get at the knight's pistol, and Hutchin that held the ladder and my good seer that stood beside him hears a loud skillop. A minute after, Sir John flings the body of the jackanate down to them and cries that the siller is fund and that they should come up and help him. And there was the bag of siller, sure enough, and money or things beside that had been missing for money a day. And Sir John when he had ripped the turret wheel, led my good seer to the dining parlor and took him by the hand and spoke kindly to him and said he was sorry he should have doubted his word and that he would hereafter be a good master him to make amends. And now, Steenie, said Sir John, although this vision of yours tends on the whole to my father's credit as an honest man that he should, even after his death, desire to see justice done to a poor man like you, yet you are sensible that ill Disposition men might make bad constructions upon it concerning his soul's health. So I think we had better lay the hail dirdum on that ill deedy creature, Major Wire, and say nothing about your dream in the wood of Pitmurky. You had taken our muckle brandy to be very certain about only thing and steamy this receipt. His hand shook while he held it out, is but a queer kind of document. And we will do best, I think, to put it quietly in the fire. Odd, but for as queer as it is, it's a the voucher I have for my rent, said my good sire, who was afraid it may be of losing the benefit of Sir Robert's discharge. I will bear the contents to your credit in the rental book and give you a discharge under my own hand, said Sir John, and that on the spot and steamy 
if you can hold your tongue about this matter, you shall sit from this term downward at an easier rent. Mommy, thanks to your honor, said Steenie, who saw easily in what corner the wind was. Doubtless, I will be conformable to all your honor's commands. Only I would willingly speak with some powerful minister on the subject, for I do not like the sort of Salmon's uh, appointment woke your honor's father. Do not call the phantom, my father, said Sir John, interrupting him. Wheel then, the thing that was so like him, said my good sire. He spoke of my coming back to see him this time, twelve month, and it's a weight on my conscience. A wheel then, said Sir John. If you be so much distressed in mind, you may speak to our minister of the parish. He's a douche man, regards the honor of our family and the mayor that he may look for some patronage from me. With that, my good seer readily agreed the receipt should be burnt and the laird threw it into the chimney with his ain hand. Burn it would not for them though, but it, away it flew up the loom with a lang train of sparks and at its tail and a hissing noise like a squid. My good sire gad down to the men's, and the minister, when he had heard the story, said it was his real opinion that though my good sire had gained very fair in tampering with dangerous matters, yet as he refused the devil's arles for such was the offer of meat and drink, and had refused to do homage by piping at his bidding, he hoped that if he held a circumspect walk hereafter, Satan could take little advantage by what was come and gain, and indeed my good sire of his ain accord, lang for swore, bathed the pipes and the brandy, it was not even till the year was out, and the fatal day passed that he would so much as take the fiddle or drink the squabois or tippany. Sir John made up his story about the jackanape as he liked himself, and some believe till this day there was no more in the matter than the filching nature of the brute. Indeed, he'll no hinder some to threat that it was named of the old enemy that Dougal and my good sire Hutchin saw in the laird's room, but only that wenchy creature, the major, capering on the coffin, and that as to the blowing on the laird's whistle that was heard after he was dead, and the filthy brute could do that as weal as the laird himself, if no better, but heaven. Hence the truth, Wilk first came out by the minister's wife, after Sir John and her ain goodman were bath in the molds. And then my good sire was what well, feel in his limb, but not in his judgment or memory. At least nothing to speak of was obliged to tell the real narrative to his friends for the credit of his good name. He might else have been charged for a warlock. And of course, warlock has nothing to do with whether you do witchcraft or not. It's, you know, that you've broken your oath. But honestly, if people die... And there's doubt because people can't testify. Well, don't take from them because, you know, the doubt. And, you know, the devil, the devil doesn't take sides in terms of looking good or looking bad. I mean, except to serve a purpose, right? Um, whichever political side, both of those are served. Um taking on many forms, all that sort of stuff. But yeah, people using the church again. The, the, the Bible does say to kill people of different religions. So, you know, that, that used to be a threat and that's probably going to be a threat in more places again. <laughs>